I am so excited to be here with Marilyn Okoro, who is a British track and field athlete. Uh, she represented England in the Beijing Olympics in 2008, and she finished third in the 800 meters in 2007 and 2008 in the World Athletics Final. So thank you so much for being here and taking the time to talk to me today. I know you are quite busy. Uh, so I always ask uh, everyone to introduce themselves. So I would love to kind of, if you could introduce yourself a little bit and also maybe say what you're, what you're up to right now. Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me. Um, we're all busy, but it's, you know, this is something I'm super passionate about. So I was really, it was important for me to have this conversation with you. So thank you for having me. So like you, thank you for the introduction. I'm a two-time Olympian for Team GB, specializing in the 800 and 400. Um, I'm also a working athlete. So I also work for a charity where we support the homeless community where I live in Wigan. I work very closely with the council because I'm in the crisis department and that's a very um, difficult, challenging job, but it's also very rewarding seeing people transition. Um, I'm super passionate about transition in general. I think in life we're always going through different transitions and as an athlete, I know I've been through several myself. So um, looking at life after track, which is quite soon, <laughs> I'm trying to go for one more Olympics, which is next year. Um, but after that, I'm really passionate about athlete welfare. And so I'm doing a lot of mentoring at the moment and um, just helping athletes understand that they're more than just their sport and what it is to really be an elite athlete. So yeah, busy, busy, but you know, it's, um, it's the spice of life. There's so many layers to us as individuals. So I'm just trying to tap into all those different areas. <laughs> and what about training? Are you still able to train now and as usual or how is, how is that? <laughs> what is usual anymore? Um, so because I run the 800 and the 400, I've always had to be quite creative with my training. Um, I'm not always on the track. I, you know, I do a lot of my training outside. Um, obviously with lockdown all athletes have had to be really creative we haven't had access to our coaches and things so um i recently um moved up to wigan so there is a lot of spaces so basically i just have to be really creative um obviously lockdown when gyms closed a lot of it was home workouts which i never used to like i never really like training my own i always need people around me um but actually i followed a lot of stuff online um, and I was in a place where I was just building back into my training. So um, I just followed a friend of mine who's a PT down in London and it was like being in a, in a class. Um, with work, we transitioned, obviously our offices closed very early. My department was the first one to close. And a lot of the, athlete, um, the athletes, the residents we work with were placed in a local hotel. And so my manager called me in one day and said, you know, would you mind um, running the gym? So I was like, oh, okay blessing there's no gyms open but we've got a resident gym because essentially that's their home um, and so I started the program there and also it meant you know it's quite difficult to get engagement with um, the community you work with so um, initially it was very much just one person a day <laughs> but I got a lot of time to do a lot of the rehab I was trying to do um, and it actually just helped me increase my motivation so now I'm in a full-time training program this is my third week um, I'm working with a new coach remotely, which is good because it gives me the leeway to sort of coach myself as well. At 35, I pretty much am the expert of me and I know what I need to do, but I do need that sort of partnership, which I've struggled to find in the past. So I'm enjoying it. It's a little shock to the muscles and the system. I've been given a, a key to the local track, so I have the track to myself. So I'm in a good place. I'm very motivated to get up each day and train before or after training because that can be quite difficult when you're not feeling great like just getting out the door so um just taking it week by week day by day sometimes um, but the body's adapting well so that keeps me mentally strong <laughs> yeah and how, how do you uh, this is not actually one of my questions but I just thought because you said you're very motivated and i think a lot of people are kind of struggling with motivation at this time so how, how do you stay motivated or or what is it that you're kind of using to to keep keep that motivation yeah, so I, last year I was really, really low. I struggled with depression for the first time in my life. Um, I think I'm used to being quite anxious, but I'm um, actually just having low mood and not wanting to see people and get out and not wanting to run. That was a real alarm bell to me. So I make sure that, you know, things are on my terms. That's what I say about chasing this next Olympics. I want to get there on my terms, which means um, I'm taking ownership and making decisions for myself and making sure I'm enjoying it. 
um, I have the right people around me. I think sometimes um, you can, you know, the people that are around you influence your mind and your thoughts so much, but I didn't realize how many toxic people I had around me. And sometimes it's not even that they don't mean well for me, they just don't understand. But um, yeah, I think it's just, and also I think I was in a place where I wasn't really appreciating the journey I've been on. Um, so I make sure like every day I'm just, you know, and this is something lockdown has created for everyone. You know, we had to be still and we had to reflect. And so I'm really grateful for the journey that I've been on with athletics so far. And I felt like I'm not done. Um, and I've been really um, precise in the goals that I've set myself. They have to be really, really realistic. Um, you know, I had to ask myself, is getting to Tokyo next year realistic? Um, and then I broke that down and, and asked myself why. Um, so it's a lot of intrinsic work that I've had to do and self-care, listening to my body so much more than I ever used to. I think people look at you and think, oh my gosh, you're in great shape and it just happens. But you know, I was pushing myself so much and to the point where at times it wasn't healthy, but I wasn't listening to you know, how I was feeling or the aches and pains I was feeling. I was just chasing the times and the targets and feeling really rushed. So now I don't rush anything. I just make sure that I'm sort of balanced, as balanced as I can every day. Yeah. And is that something you've just done with yourself that work or, or do you have people kind of supporting you in, the, in that journey? Um, yeah, I predominantly, uh, I haven't, I've worked on and off with sort of sports psychs. Um, obviously last year, uh, a friend of mine's a counselor, so she helped me. I did, you know, I sort of had medication through the NHS and, I knew that that would help me sleep and, and be a bit productive, but I want, I knew my circumstances had to change. So a friend of mine who was a counselor, she did a bit of work with me. Um, I'm quite a people person. So I just like to feel connected. So I have some good friends that I feel I can trust and talk to. And I think that's what spurs me on for helping athletes. Cause I feel like they need to understand what support is out there because a lot of my journey, I just was kind of going along and didn't really know who to access, who, you know, and it's really important that you do reach out and ask for support because I don't think we achieve anything on our own. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of it, in fact, my journey, I feel like I could have done, this could have been smoother, but hey, like, let me learn from this and use it to support others. Mm. Yes, I suppose sometimes the obstacles is what makes us better as well. <laughs> yes, definitely. My life story, the obstacles are the things that have pushed me through. Um, it's, you know, it's helped. I've just been laser focused on, you know, if something says no, I need to turn it into a yes. <laughs> uh, and it's been my fuel, essentially. <laughs> mm. So, of course, I'm, I'm so big on like promoting sports psychology. Um, so I'm really kind of interested to find out like, kind of what role does sports psychology or mindset uh, play, play in your career? Or is still playing in your career? Oh, yeah. Mindset is everything. It's, you know, not just sports, anything in life. It starts in the mind and especially this work that I'm doing. Bringing these people into the gym, I realize how much what they're telling themselves impacts what they're going to do. A lot of them walk in and they just look at the gym and they're like, oh, there's not much here. What am I supposed to do? Or they'll look at me and be like, I want to bench press, but there's no one here to help me. And I'm just like, uh, I already they just have those preconceived ideas or they're telling themselves they can't do it and with me I've just always been someone that you know I don't really believe in can't <laughs> we have to find a way so mindset to me is really important I um I talk about champion mindset all the time because I feel like it's just being willing to do whatever it takes so for me I know I'm working at 10 I have to be at the track at six I don't always feel like being at the track at six but I know that that is what I need to do that day to contribute towards me getting to Tokyo. Um, I recently changed a vegan diet um, because I have knee injuries. And, you know, if I was going to be realistic about getting back on track of an elite lifestyle, I needed my, you know, I needed everything. I need to leave no stone left unturned. So a lot of the injuries I had, inflammation and overuse injuries, um, I knew my system needed a bit of a reset. Um, many people had talked to me about vegan diet. I'm from Nigeria originally, like my family roots. So meat is everything. So it was like a big thing for me to, what, no meat in my diet. I love dairy, cheesecake is my life, but that was what I was willing to do because, you know, and I'm glad I um, sort of overcame that because it's so easy to just say, you know, it's not what I enjoy, but actually I'm really enjoying exploring, you know, different recipes, 
and seeing actually I can get protein sources from other places and I feel energized and I feel like, oh my God, this is a challenge I've overcome to work towards my goal. And it's, you know, I'm seeing the results in the beginning. Yes, it was hard, but if you push through, um, you get to the other side of, of that fear and you know what you think you can't achieve, you just smash through it. So yeah, champion mindset is everything. <laughs> yeah. And what, so you said that sometimes you have to be at the track at six because you know that that's the kind of only time you have to train. So I don't know, I'm not good on waking up early. So I wonder what do you, when, when the alarm rings at, I don't know, five or five thirty, whenever, what, what do you tell yourself to get you going uh, and to kind of motivate yourself at that moment? I love my bed. So <laughs> I'm just like, it rings and I kind of think already, like, why am I getting up already? But it depends if I've gone to bed, you know, on time and been disciplined the night before, it's not so bad. You know, my readiness to wake up is all right. Once I've opened my eyes, I've got quite a light bedroom on purpose. Um, but some days, you know, like when you're into week four of training and like Thursday, that's my hardest day Thursday because it's my last track session and Fridays are my rest day. And it goes off and you just think, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> I could just, you know, have a normal life. I'm 35. Let me just enjoy life and drink Prosecco. But then I suddenly think about, you know, for me just last year, I was just wishing I could run. Um, I was, you know, locked down. We don't have, you know, not many people are still not able to access a track. So I think about, you know, I've got a whole track to myself. Um, my body is health, not in pain anymore. I owe this to myself, so I need to get out of bed, and that kind of helps. I've got an amazing new puppy. He's 10 months tomorrow, and he's like a little blessing as well. So usually I have to get up out of bed to let him go to the garden in the morning. So once I've taken those first few steps, I'm up, so I might as well get ready. So, you know, it's it's a lot of talk. I'm not going to pretend I just jump out of bed. I'm not 22 anymore. That was Those days are not, not here. There's a lot of other things that that pull my attention and um you know the body doesn't recover the same it takes a lot longer so when you have like pain and all that stuff dictating things it's a lot of noise and chatter that you have to get through but when i remember what i'm doing and what the end result is and i just you know and also i'm just kind to myself like i think i used to think every day i need to like smash and do a world record whereas i know it's like no we're just going to go through the moment moments of process and the plan that I'm doing the main goal is relaxation and form because I need to get back into my rhythm and that's something that that's why the coach is so important because I've always had coaches like saying you need to smash this time and you need to do this I'm focusing on everything that I wasn't whereas the coach I have now he's just you know really realistic and he's just like he puts the times down so we know what we're working towards but in bold it says right now i want form and he gives me the cues to think about when you have cues to think about it just totally takes the pressure off because in this moment i'm thinking of my arms and lifting my knees and i'm very um process orientated so i need those those kind of cues to know that you know this and, and i also love to understand why i'm doing what i'm doing because i feel like i've done a lot of years of just going with what i've been told and then it just doesn't make sense. But you get confidence when you understand why you're doing something. So it's really, really important. I hope he wants to join in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned these like cues that you, that you use, and it's something that I use a lot as well with my clients, like keywords or cues to kind of focus your mind. So is that something you've always used or is that a new thing that you use with this trainer or? Um, with training, um, in actual training, not really. Um, one of my coaches used to blow a whistle, um, which I felt helped me knowing like I'm hitting my pace and targets, but it was all very performance based. Like, are we on track for running PVs? So that comes with a lot of pressure when you're thinking like that. On race day, um, I would give myself some cues. And I would say, you know, I want to be in the top three and or I would use the signage, you know, around an athletics competition, there's like sponsor signs around the track. Mm -hmm. So I would be like, you know, I want to hit this in this certain time, but that's what we did in training. So I was very just always focused on time, but I realized that also gave me a lot of pressure um, and that led to a lot of anxiety. So it is pretty new to me in terms of giving my body cues because I know when I'm relaxed, that's when I run really well and I'm, I'm quite powerful. So I need to be able to be in control of that power. <laughs> um, 
so yeah it's something that oh my gosh I wish I knew this 10 years ago <laughs> yeah I think with age also sometimes or at least experience I'm also 35 uh, I think great age isn't it <laughs> yeah you think oh if I just known this 10 years ago it would have been so much easier <laughs> Listen, I'm just like, I actually love my 30s. It's like you do, you do all the same stuff, but with more wisdom <laughs> and avoid the catastrophe. But you know, that's what makes you who you are. But yeah, you just got more clear about what you want and what you don't want, what you'll tolerate, what you won't tolerate. So yeah, I'm enjoying training as a mature athlete. I guess the thing that I fight is in the UK, everyone thinks you're old after 25 to be in sport so the moment I need to st I always reference my age when with like uh, even though I'm 35 I'm still trying and I need to kind of stop have you got any tips for me because it's such a big thing that people talk about all the time you know aren't you going to retire you're not married you haven't got any kids why are you still running but my body is still working as good as ever as long as I'm healthy I know I can achieve what I want to achieve on the track so age ain't nothing but a number <laughs> But also, maybe that is important why, that you're mentioning, obviously, depends what context you mention it in, but, but because then other people might see, okay, actually, it is possible to do it at that age because you're doing it. And you'll be like a, a role model for them. Because the problem is, if there's no one doing it at a certain age, then you think, well, you can't run at 40. Maybe you can, maybe just no one is doing it. 100%. That's so, so true. And that's, you know, I really aim, I talk about being, you know, a real role model because I want people to see that it's not easy. I think when you go into schools and kids are just like, have you got any medals? Have you won races? And that's the focus when you're so young. But actually a lot of my medals are the products of a lot of years. Anyone that's achieved anything, they'll tell you there's been a lot of unsuccessful years behind it. Um, I think with me, my message is just understanding um, my self-awareness was really, really low. So I didn't understand what I was doing, which meant I didn't understand how great it was which meant I wasn't giving myself the, I wasn't championing myself and I was expecting that to come from other people. So when it doesn't and you're getting criticized, it has a really bad impact. So a lot of things I'm trying to sort of dispel these myths that are in the sporting culture, you know, like age and like how you should look when you're a certain, um, when you were an 800 meter runner, you know, cause I didn't look like all the other girls. Um, you know, even sort of myths around, you know, you are a brand, you are your brand and everyone should be working around you and that's okay i think athletes tend to be sort of bullied into a bit of a what you've got because of the agents and the coaches that they're working with and i don't agree with that they should be sort of understanding that they're the vehicle to listen to things and just making it a lot more athlete centered because we all want to feel valued we all want to feel important and and that's where we get our confidence to then go and perform essentially and you know a lot of people come into sport because it's their childhood dream for me it wasn't so much okay. <laughs> um it was something that i loved and i enjoyed it and i was good at it and those are the things that kept me in it for so long so when it turned to my job and that all changed to politics and pressure and you know negative talk it was really difficult because it was like a rude awakening like oh my gosh people aren't that nice <laughs> um and I'm, i remember when i started speaking in schools i wanted to focus more on the mindset and having a growth mindset and and also i feel like with kids today it's so instant like you can just get anything like that they don't realize that they have to dig deep and they have to persevere and they have to push yeah. and you know it's not always about winning every single day because it's the long haul and it's actually celebrating things that may not look like a win and seeing how that's going to help you get to your big goal yeah and I think also often what we see, like if we watch TV or we see interviews with people, we see all those medals and when you're winning and then all the difficult moments, we don't really see those. And then we think, well, we, okay, we haven't seen that. So we just seen all the good stuff. And then we think, well, I know, talk about lull you into false sense of security. Um, yeah, I, there's a slide I always talk about. It's kind of, you know, we always see the glory, but we need to know the story behind it. And then ask yourself, are you willing to do that? Because I think, you know, with social media, I love social media, it's an amazing tool, but it just, you know, you don't see the whole picture. And, you know, I think impressionable people really, and I never, because I'm, I'm someone that I'm always looking for someone that's been through something and has a, a, a really important message and that's who I connect with. Mm -hmm. um, 
and none of this quick fix nonsense but some people really do fall for that and and I, it's sad when I go in and I talk to girls because they don't like the way they look and because of you know societal pressures and I'm just like I love PE as a kid so I just can't understand it you know something so you know you've only got one you one body you need to celebrate that and be proud of it and we're all unique so it's about finding where you fit in and what's your gift what's your that not allowing other people's goals to be dictating your life and how you feel about yourself which is very easy to sit here and say and I can't say I've always had this mindset but definitely like we're just saying experience is a huge teacher and I think sport taught, taught me that I can't with everyone and um so it's important to know you know your community and your people ultimately i needed to be doing what i'm doing for myself first yeah so so would you would you say that there was like uh, you mentioned a little bit like they had this like laser focus and these things would you say there was like a secret ingredient to your like personality or something that made you successful in sport secret ingredient that'd be great i'd love to know what it is um I think from a young age, I always talk about my mum and her influence over me from a young age because she didn't like me doing sport. She didn't like me running. Um, and also my first coach as well. So he essentially was my dad. <laughs> at 10 years old, I met him at school. So together, I think, you know, they both had different influences. So my mum was kind of fearful that sport wasn't a great, you know, career avenue to go down. Nigerian background education is important. She wanted me to be a lawyer, a doctor you know something that actually you know traditionally was successful <laughs> like what is sport <laughs> whereas my coach he saw that I didn't have that kind of support outside of school and he wanted to keep me in the sport yes I had the talent however hard work can outdo talent and also opportunities and the environment you're in so um, it was that mix of you know wanting to prove to both of them that I could do this um, and that's kind of, I've had that kind of attitude. Like, if you tell me I can't do something, I will show you. I can. Um, and so, yeah, just that determination to, to be the best I can be. Um, and I just love challenges. Like I think that's actually something I see a lot with the, with athletes and the personalities, that kind of love of a challenge. Uh, so that's yeah. Yeah. It makes it worth doing. Like, I don't want to just do it for no reason. Even like with training, I, I mean, I've got an appreciation now for people keeping fit and keeping healthy because my mindset was so focused on performance before, whereas then when I got ill, I was like, oh, actually, I need to do this for my, just for my sanity and just to feel good and just movement is so nice. So actually, when I started back running, I started dancing first and that's how I ended up meeting Shem and the Change Foundation. But it was just, I couldn't, because running wasn't, everyone kept saying, go for a run. I didn't have the energy to go for a run because for me, running meant performance and I just wanted to enjoy it so I thought I'd find something else that had the same effect and just built up from there but you still need a goal whatever you're trying to do you know you still need something to work towards something to push yourself um but ultimately it starts with you know do I love doing this how does it make me feel um and so I've always been a competitive person when it comes to running and food, <laughs> I love, you know, just competing because um, those are the things I enjoy, but just having that edge and something to just keep you going. And like when you think you can't go anymore because you, you don't want someone else to keep you, so you're just going to push. And often when you push, you find, oh, I've got a bit more to give. <laughs> so it's exciting. I don't actually love training. Everyone thinks, oh my gosh, you get to train all day. No, that's so painful. Why would I want to do that when <laughs> I could be sitting on my couch watching Love Island? But it's what it takes. You know, that champion mindset is what it takes to achieve competing well. And I love to compete. So that's enough of a driver for me. <laughs> you mentioned that you, you kind of had some, you were quite, you're quite an anxious person, person and you had some challenges with like depression and anxiety. So how, how have you, is that something you've always dealt with through your career? And is, how did you kind of, how are you managing that? Um, so... Yeah, I think most athletes will have that element of anxiety because there's so much pressure on the line. I think we, we revel in it as well. Like I would love like, okay, when the gun goes, what's going to happen? Let's just go with it. It's just that feel the fear, just do it. Um, I think sort of growing up, I had like quite a lot of affirmation. I had quite an unstable upbringing. So you kind of just have that anxiety because all you, you're in your head a lot. Um, but then last year when I was just so low, that was the first time I felt like 
oh my gosh, I don't want to do anything. Like I literally can just stay in these four walls. But I think it was, it was isolation, you know, and the, the, the longer you stay in that mindset, it's very easy to get comfortable there. And then you just lose, you know, you lose your kind, you're in a bubble. Um, and I guess that's a lot of what people are feeling with lockdown because it's like, you're just confined to those four walls. And if you don't have family around you, so I was very, very lucky because I actually just moved just before it was like <laughs> lockdown, lockdown. And I moved next to some incredible neighbors and they were so great with, in terms of just connection over the fence in the back garden. Every time they were going to the supermarket, they helped me. Also having my job meant, you know, I was communicating with people and seeing people and obviously having my puppy was the best thing ever. But um, yeah, it's just, it's so important to be aware of what you're thinking and feeling all the time. So I try, I'm not there yet, but I need to start journaling a lot more because I think I had a block. So I used to write all the time and then God knows what happened. and. And I know that it's when I read back things that I've written, I'm like, oh, wow, there were little signs there. Mm. You know, same with a training diary. You can pinpoint an injury. if You just go back through your diary because you can see when it started to come and it helps you learn about yourself. Also, your goals should be in that, you know, and so I'm kind of slowly getting better at it. I'm very good at procrastinating. And I know that's a part of my anxiety and all depression, whichever one. Um, but I know it's, it's helpful. So and once I get into the flow and, and I, I know I'm a lot better, but I do know I kind of have that period of just procrastination and just getting going, which tells me I've still got some work to do. Um, mm. But I haven't really been working with anyone lately. I think I've just been um, kind of just so busy and just keeping focused on the, the different campaigns and things that I've had to do. But now I'm starting to train and so less outside and get more focused on my athletics. I know I'm going to need strong tools around me to keep me, keep me um, from getting isolated again, basically, because it's quite a lonely sport. We spend a lot of time traveling on camps, um, just time where you need to just stay home and rest. So you can't be out with your friends and those are choices we make, but it also, it has, a, it has an impact um, on your well-being. Mm. Mm. So, you said you might you work with the sports psychologist before in, in yeah. Your, yeah so um did, what kind of techniques were you using from that or did you find it helpful working with the sports psychologist or was it was it for particular things that came in or was it just kind of general so initially when i was on the world class performance plan um by the funded by the lottery um so british athletics would allocate us sports psychologists but my experience with the first one I had, she kind of said to me that she just wasn't, obviously obviously professional boundaries, she wasn't really qualified to deal with anything else other than my athletics. So I don't know if that's how I took it, but I felt like there's the things that bothered me weren't, wasn't my running at that point. I just ran, I didn't really, I was like, I'm always winning, I don't care. But stuff was happening off the track that I wanted to address. So instead of maybe signposting to someone that could help me, that's what she said to me. And so I kind of had a bit of a negative, like, well, I don't need this then. I can read a book and find out what you're telling me. Um, and then I had, I think I had a relationship breakdown in 2011. We split up and I was just a bit low, but I had an appointment at the hospital to see our team doctors. And they said, oh, we've got a new um, therapist. Would you like to meet him and maybe going forward work with him? And he did a lot of CBT with me which I felt was really great because I was learning about my patterns of behavior and, you know, he would talk and I just, you know, I needed an outlet. And um, so I liked some of the techniques we did and I worked with him for quite a few years until I moved to America. Um, and then it was just a bit difficult to coordinate. And so, yeah, I have a lot of time for cognitive behavioral therapy. I think it's really, really, it's what, something that really worked for me. And we would work on things on and off the track. And also it helped with preparation and race day as well, because I never had a plan really. It was just like, man. <laughs> um, so he'd give me some really helpful tools. Um, and that's where I kind of came across mindfulness, um, which I think is so effective. And it's something that I literally practice every day <laughs> because my mind runs away with me so much forwards or backwards. <laughs> so it's nice to just be, you know, I, I crave being in a peaceful place because something I've learned about my life is that 
drama is just there it's out there but it's how I respond to it and um just kind of keeping my internal peace relatively calm so I can just keep persevered and have that laser focus um, we did a bit of visual visualization which I find extremely difficult <laughs> um, but it's good when you can I think it's because I've had so many injuries so I struggle to see myself running how I want to be running because it's clouded by you know in this pain and that so hopefully now I'm in a better place physically those that will come again and when I'm actually thinking racing is actually going to happen um, but definitely mindfulness is, is amazing <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, uh, I, I love uh, visualization or imagery as well and and actually there's ways that you can use it for rehabilitation like to imagine that the thing is healing and they, there's results showing that it heals faster because of it uh, this is not something I've worked with but just because you oh, might, might need to try that because yeah. I know there's like you know people say oh you, you keep you might not be injured but you keep thinking you are and you know, I'm just like, oh, whatever. I know my body, it is injured. But <laughs> there was a period where I was going to physios and they kept telling me, this muscle is okay. I know there's been a tear. I know there's been damage, but it's okay. And I was just like, wow, it's actually really something I'm stuck on. And it's because 2014, 2015, 2016, I tore the same hamstring on the same side and it stopped me from running. So I think there's a bit of a block yeah. that I developed there. <laughs> and also you get so used to maybe protecting that, that part of your body. Okay. Yeah, stuck in your head even though your body part is actually fine. yeah exactly and even like I can identify with that with trying to push and running like I'm just like oh maybe not too much maybe and holding myself back and then like one day I'll try something I'm like oh man I've been wasting all this time thinking it's gonna hurt and it's not <laughs> and it's just the block in your mind and, and not in the body yeah it's interesting yeah. as well that you said with the sports psychology and that that we can't deal with kind of things outside and I think that's a little bit of we do kind of say that in the beginning, but I think it's, uh, we are allowed to deal with everything outside um, our sport as well. It's just that if there's like a clinical disorder, like clinically depressed or something like that, then we're not allowed to. to kind of, of course. Yeah, I get that. And I think at the time I wasn't, so it was just like, and it, it was the introduction. I think it's sometimes it's like how you start off and I took it like that. So it's just, it was a shame because actually, they probably, you know, in, as I've seen and gone on, sports psych is a huge part of a performance in any industry, but so much more sports. And it would have been great to have had that dimension and that kind of support, I guess. But I also think for almost everyone, it's your whole life affects your sport. So, so to kind of ignore that, I thought when I started working in sports psychology, just be like, okay, do imagery and then do this. And then, <laughs> yeah. but now when I'm talking to, to athletes, it's always about every, it's like about their husband or their boyfriend, or they can't have find enough time or they can't plan around it or, you know, whatever it is. And, and obviously yeah. it's interesting, but it's like all these life things that there sometimes needs to be fixed because you can sit and make all these goals, but if then it doesn't fit with your life, then what's the point? exactly and I think so much and that's why I'm so passionate about you know what it is to be elite it's different to everyone but it does start with the mind and it's you know it's an elite environment and having that support network and you know we're, athletes, we're not just our sport mm. we're not just you know there's so many layers we're like an onion just keep you know unpeeling and all those things is what makes us good at our sport so for me I came into athletics from a multi-sport background, I played lacrosse, tennis, um, netball, and they were, you know, I played them to a good standard. I probably could have been professional in any one of those, but running was the thing that had my heart and it was affordable to me. Um, and it's the one that stuck. I was also a singer and, and loved, you know, being in the choir and doing drama. So there was all these different layers to me. I was very social. And I think, you know, for a long time, that's kind of what kept me balanced. And then when I went pro <laughs> in athletics it was difficult because it was just all about athletics and I had no other outlet and I, I made that decision because my coach told me I wasn't serious enough and I was like okay I need to show that I'm serious so mm. <laughs> but I'm not that person even when I'm at the, at the competition day I like to be smiling I like to be light of heart and I like to connect with people and say hello don't get me wrong when I'm warming up and I'm on the track it's business, it's showtime, but I'm not like that super serious person. My headphones, I like to be aware of my surroundings and 
I know how to keep, you know, maybe because I've grown up with a lot of ah, dysfunction around me. So I know how to keep focused on what I'm trying to do in spite of everything. Um, but to other people, it might look like I'm not serious enough or whatever, but I had to learn that actually I can't let other people's, di you know, opinions dictate everything. And, but I did try and I tried to just be this elite athlete, whatever that's supposed to be. <laughs> Yeah. And that's the journey I've been on, to be honest. And I think I just want to encourage other athletes to embrace this other side of them because you are, there's more to you. You know, there's more to all of us than just one, not just one thing, you know? So. And, and I think it's so important as well to know that everyone is different. There's like no right answer. It's not like, I get this a lot as well. Like people, they've seen some top athlete and they, okay, they've been sitting with their hair, earphones on focus. <laughs> I must do the same. So they just said, but they don't know why and they don't even know if it works for, for them. Yeah. It's important to like kind of see, well, what do I need? Like, do I get energy from being around chatting to people? Is that how I relax? Then maybe that's what you should be doing. Maybe some people. Exactly. Need and yeah. Just, but everyone yeah. can't just take, look at someone and be like, if I want the same, I must do the same. Maybe when we start chatting to people after seeing you, they'll be like, well, now that's what we must do. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's like, you've got to do what works for you. Be you all the time. And we saw that a little bit when Bolt came on the scene. And, um, you know, he's a jokester. That's how he gets into his zone. He's dancing. And then, like, <laughs> suddenly they, the 100 meter men's became like a little show because everyone started doing something like that but you could see that people it wasn't natural to them and it impacted their performance and some of them actually oh my god they raised their game because they chilled out yeah. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting to, to, to that you said that because you know everyone is different and it's about always doing what works for you but it takes a while to learn that as well for some people some people just know and they're very you know they've had that affirmation from a long time and they're very sure in their identity and some aren't. Um, and so that's kind of definitely a big message that I want people to, if there are on my socials, cause I take that role very seriously, but Hey, this is, you know, what works for me. That's like a lot of athletes don't like to share their training. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm not really like that because I've had to be very creative with my training and Hey, this is some stuff that's worked amazingly for the 400, 800 meter runner. And there isn't a lot of information on that. So here, this is what I do share it, but also remember, I'm not you and you're not me, so you will respond differently. So just be mindful and adapt it to you. And that's what I've had to do. I think a lot of years of my training, I've been given systems and programs that are not designed for me um, and without me in mind. And they don't really, either I'm overtraining or I'm not working hard enough. So it's about being able to be adaptable and, you know, really be specific. I'm doing my PT course at the moment. And one of the first principles you learn is specificity. And it's like, goodness, like my whole career, why haven't, haven't they been tailoring it to me? I get that you want to coach a lot of athletes, but you still have to, there's a general formula, but you have to adapt that to every athlete because every athlete's going to react totally differently. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, I wonder, so you, <clears throat> you mentioned when you're about to run, you have this like, feel the fear, uh, you, you, so I wonder what, when you're standing there and you are like in the Olympics or, or one of these big uh, runs, and what, when, what do you think about when you're about to, to kind of just about to run? Is there like any particular thoughts in your head or, or what do you tell yourself or at that moment? I'm the honest answer. Yeah. <laughs> what am I doing here again? Um, that's what I always say that to myself. Um, I love the crowd. So generally at the bigger races, I feel better. I usually sort of just, you know, the crowd gives me energy. Then I bring it to the track. I get the racy girls. I get my competitive head on. And then I bring it to me and I just tell myself, you are ready and you want to be here. Let's do this. I just remember how hard I've trained. So I usually it's like, you're ready. That's what I have to tell myself because I am ready. <laughs> and yeah. usually like 10 days before I'll have my last time trial and it's, you know, it's gone great. I've been training at a prep camp. Um, so I just, yeah, you're ready. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what would you say has been like the biggest kind of challenge in your career and, and how did you, how did you cope with it? Uh, I think the biggest challenge for me has always been like financial up because that's how I started. I started from very humble beginnings. So 
you know, athletics was the sport because you didn't need a lot. You just needed your legs and you didn't have to have the best stuff necessarily to keep up. You know, it's not like with equestrian, you need a horse or, you know, tennis, you need to fly to all these luxurious camps like athletics. You can just train on the streets. You can enter your local meets. You've got your club that, you know, doesn't cost anything to join. Um, so just as I've tried to, you know, I've always felt like I've been trying to keep up and then I've had some amazing sponsors over the years and then through no fault of my own, you know, contracts end and they're, you know, especially around the Olympic cycle, they're quite keen to take athletes on and then at the end it's like, bye. And a lot of them I was like, um, do you still want to work with me? And they're like, you know, you're great. I was just dealing with that kind of knockback and then thinking, okay, so... For a lot of my career, I was under the British Athletics lottery funding system. So it was, you know, it was comfortable. I could do what I needed to do. And then when you lose all of that, it's the uncertainty. You're just like, okay. And that's when stress comes. No disrespect to agents, but, you know, they are about um, the performance. And, and a lot of the time, the athlete isn't the focus. So for me, just the business aspect of it, you know, um and also just knowing like maybe i should have been doing a few things extra to prepare myself for life after sport but it starts preparing that preparation starts whilst i'm still doing my sport and you know there's a lot of things i'm doing now that i could have been doing before so yeah the, i guess no one tells you how to be an elite athlete <laughs> the professional <laughs> side <laughs> oh, exactly there should be like some kind of training for it right there is. And that's definitely something that I feel called to, you know, explore. And at the moment I'm just talking to athletes, like, what is it you've needed? What is it? You know, I know what I've needed, but I'm just one, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. tiny speck in this huge spectrum. Um, and just understanding, again, you are a brand, you know, and, you know, just having that kind of, I feel like when I lived in America for five years, 2013 to 2018, I felt like they get that as well, but because the competition is so fierce, they have to, and they need to have that thing to make them stand out. And a lot of them have endorsements and have their own businesses alongside their track career. Whereas over here, it's just waiting for the national governing body to say you're good enough to be on funding and they can't fund everyone. So there's going to be some people that are good enough that won't be on that funding. Um, and that does a lot of team when you work so hard and, you know, give everything you can to a sport but you're not supported like that but that that you can still survive without lottery funding you can you can start your own business or you can partner with people that privately that understand the journey that you're on um but it's getting that message out there and letting athletes know that this is possible and you don't have to feel guilty that you're not a full-time athlete <laughs> yeah and i think that is actually really important and you said that you want to go into doing something like that when you finish but I think uh, talking, I've talked to quite a lot of athletes also that are retired um, and they, they kind of said that, well, you have all this support while you're an athlete and then suddenly, and then, and then you're like, <laughs> there you go. And then, yeah. first of all, you're not like, you're used to saying when people say, what do you do? You're like, oh, I'm an athlete and do this. And then suddenly you're like, what are you? And you're like, oh, I know, identity <laughs> crisis. <laughs> and, and I think if you have another business on the side of it, well, then you can kind of somehow easier transition in because you already know yeah. it's not just a big change yeah it's crazy because the only thing that's guaranteed in athletics is that one day you will not be doing it anymore or in sport that is an actual guarantee you're not going to do it forever and um, relative to the years that you spend doing your sport you're going to be alive more <laughs> longer so it's crazy that we're not thinking and planning for that ahead of time and it's great, like everyone says, you need to do this now because you're not going to be an athlete for very long. Exactly, that's the reason why we need to prepare for what we're going to do next. So that transition is, is smoother. And, you know, you have time for your injured in your sport. It's, it comes with the territory. And, you know, you could be doing, using that time a lot, wise, a lot more wisely um, than sitting there. And, you know, for me, I know a lot, I spend a lot of months just watching my competitors compete and championships going by and just getting in a hole which get, makes it so much harder to recover from. Um, I know like in other industries, they have like occupational health therapists and, you know, we need that in sport. Like I know some teams might have that actually, the team environment is better. And plus you have your teammates around you. But I know with individual sports, it's like, who's making sure that you're getting the right physio and you're getting the um, mental health support you need and the psychology help you need. And 
you know, and actually thinking about, okay, what are my goals around this? How am I going to navigate this? And I think, you know, it's, it seems so obvious when you, you think about it, but then it's like, it's not happening. So we need to, some, there's lots of work to be done with the culture. Yeah. I think when I've been injured, it's been my most lonely time in sport because my coach doesn't know what to do with me. Oh, you can't train. Okay. Uh, don't hear from you again. And then you're, you're not around your training partners, you know, you, you know, your friends are there, but they're all busy doing their life as well. And they're working during the day when you're sat at home, like <laughs> twiddling your thumbs. But when you have to train, you don't mind. But now I'm just actually just injured sitting here contemplating life. <laughs> yeah. And I think especially injuries as well, it's something that it, I think that person that you said that kind of takes care of everything should be the sports psychology. But, but the problem is that if, if the sports psychology is just paid by the organization, they might just send you in just for, not for a kind of longer period of time, but I have some people that kind of just pay me by themselves to work with them. Yeah. I'm that person that can kind of like look at everything. Because also then some people be like, oh, but I'm injured now, so I'm going to have a break. And you're like, no, 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 now, now you, need you need it. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Stay, stay within the, like maybe even going to practice, not practicing, obviously, but being part of it, being part of yeah. it. Because it's such a big part of your life. Suddenly you can't just step back and then be completely out of it. Exactly. It is important to still be around the community because that's you know that's your community and it's like it's good to see their faces it's good to see um and i saw that when i worked in the collegiate system so i worked for university of central florida with a track team and even if you're injured you came at practice time and you know you watched the, the group warm up and then you went for your treatment because it's all kind of like central and the hub was there and i thought that was so important for their progress and and return to play because they were just connected all the time. So it's definitely important to, I know with me, I kind of, that was my time where I'd get further and further away from my relationship with my coach and with the sport. Cause I just was like, okay, well, the longer I leave it, the harder it is to get back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if you stay within that, even if you're not physically training, but maybe you can still do some things, but you're not training in the way that you usually are, but you're still seeing the coach every day. You're still saying, okay, how are you? How's the rehabilitation? Yeah. Exactly. Everything, I think. But it, they have to be aware of that and encouraging it because yeah, it can't really come from the athletes. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. Especially when you're in such a difficult space in your head anyway, you can't always think like that. Um, but there's always something that you can be doing, even if it's, you know, in the mind. And yeah. that's kind of my mindset now. There's always something you can be doing to help your recovery, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything that you would have done differently in your career if you could have kind of done it over again or? Oh my gosh, where do we start? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a big believer in like a lot of the adversity is what makes you, but I think one thing I probably should have done was, you know, research the coaches I was working with, um, more, <laughs> okay. I think you just kind of think, oh, they've done this. And so they they're an expert and they know um and just ask more questions you know there's a lot of time where I wasn't sure and so I just did as what as I was told whereas that kind of didn't work out too well so um you know knowledge is power and I think you know you inherently have that gut feeling and because you're desperate to achieve something sometimes you kind of shove it aside and think you doubt yourself um, but actually it's okay to ask questions and just get that clarity so you can be a hundred percent sure that what you're doing is right and you have confidence in it. Um, and just, it helps communication as well. So definitely like just researching my sport in general. Um, uh, so I could understand because if you, whilst you're not completely sure on what you're doing and who you are, at least you kind of have that aspiration of what you should be working to the kind of people that you know, would be like-minded to help you get there, but searching the coaches I worked with and asking questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always think that uh, that sport and life is kind of somehow mirroring each other. And I think a lot of the skills mm -hmm. that we learn in our sport, we can use in our, in our life as well, like you also mentioned. So what is the kind of most important lesson that you've learned in your career that you can maybe use in your life as well? Oh, that's such a good question. The most important lesson is um, 
whatever you're doing, you know, you need, you need to do it with purpose and you need to understand why, you know, what is your why? Because ultimately it comes from motivation and that drive. Um, and I think a lot of people quite lost in really in life and in sport. And it's that why that kind of helps you get back on track. Um, even if you're miles away from it, you've got that, that one goal that you know, okay, this is why I started or, you know, whatever it is. And it helps you align with yourself, your beliefs, your values, and it draws that energy from other people. Um, and ultimately, I just think it's, you know, why we do purpose is everything. So whatever you're doing, so be intentional and, you know, have your purpose because really where your purpose is is what you're passionate about. Yeah, yeah. And also, we, we talked about that the, now we are 35, both of us. And, and if, yeah. <laughs> you know, if we, only we'd known at that age. So if you could have kind of go back to yourself when you started out or when you were younger, what, what kind of thing would you have wished that you could have kind of told yourself at that point? Um, so I kind of like have little hashtags that I just say to myself because I think it's what I wish I knew all along. So two of them are, you are amazing is the first one and limitless you is another hashtag I use because there's just no limits to what we can achieve. It's just accessing that mindset, that champion mindset and just go for it. Just dream big. So yeah, just, but you are amazing. A lot of like affirmation it's important to affirm yourself and you can achieve anything you really can i that is the testimony of my life so yeah, yeah that is what i would have told little 10 year old maz <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, maybe, maybe some 10 year old is sitting out there about to to go into athletics and they they will take that advice on board hopefully. i hope so because honestly you are amazing just the fact that you're taking that step um to do something for yourself and you know you've got that talent and the beauty of sport is there's so much to try and there's so many lessons so yeah and there's no limits take them all <laughs> <laughs> amazing well uh, what a great way to finish i think so thank you so much for talking to me if people want to kind of fo uh, follow you or connect with you or want to hear more about the work that you're doing also outside sport where can they where can they kind of connect with you Amazing. So I'm a very social butterfly. So across all the socials, um, age appropriate, of course, I'm not on Snapchat. Um, but Instagram, a lot, the girl underscore Okoro. You can also find me as Marilyn Okoro. Same with Twitter, Marilyn Okoro. Um, and yeah, I just put out a lot of materials because obviously I'm starting my personal training business so but yeah socials i'm just yeah i'm having a break this week actually so i want to see lots of follows when i get back um but yeah i'm always posting about positivity and just my journey you know let's let's get to tokyo 2021 i'm taking you all with me <laughs> yeah amazing so i suggest everyone go and follow you immediately so they can follow uh mm. because there's no olympics this year but uh, for next year hopefully and then they can kind of follow your journey journey towards that so, so thank you so much for talking to me and uh, it's been my pleasure. I hope that people find it. I'm sure there's lots of good advice in there that they can use. I hope so. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been good for me too. I've got little things to go and practice now, a little advice you've given me there. Thank you so much, Christina.